So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Harley Erdman. My pronouns are he, him. I am chair of the UMass Department of Theater, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the second in our series, Women in Theatrical Design. And uh, there was, for those who were asking us in the chat, there was supposed to be um, some wonderful sound design in the opening um, slide montage that we were showing. And uh, um, uh, if we weren't able to share that sound, um, we'll put that up in the post later, but it shouldn't affect today's presentation at all. So thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see, um, I see 40 participants at least um, at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning. Um, the series uh, responds to a pressing problem in our, in our work and in our industry. Women are woefully underrepresented in theater design and technical fields. According to a 2015 um, United Scenic Artist study, professional positions nationwide featured men as 86% of the lighting designers, 79% of the scenic designers, and 91% of the sound designers. Um, we are fortunate that at UMass, all four of our faculty designers are women, but UMass is not representative of the larger field. So over the course of March, we've invited four outstanding women designers to share their perspectives, talk about their craft and offer their inspirations. Last week, we had an illustrious guest costume designer. Today, we have an illustrious guest sound designer. Next Tuesday, March 16th at one o'clock, there'll be a lighting designer. And on March 30th, the last Tuesday in March at one o'clock, there'll be a guest scenic designer. Um, before we... Uh, uh, have the guest here. Um, uh, just a few thank yous. Um, the series is made possible with support from Women for UMass Amherst, WFUM. It's a network of alumni that promotes the advancement of campus programs that provide access, support, and opportunity for UMass Amherst students with preference to those projects that positively impact UMass Amherst women and their respective communities. I also want to give a big thanks to everyone who helped to put this together, Anna Maria Gosins, Willow Cohen, um, my faculty design colleagues, Amy Altadana, Yao Chen, Anya Klebikoff, Penny Remsen, to Dee Boyle Clapp and UMass Arts Extension, to the Alumni Association and Karen Battistoni, and especially to alum Jordan Mitchell, who was a superstar in helping us secure this grant in the first place over a year ago. I also want to acknowledge that we gather as the University of Massachusetts Amherst Department of Theater on the traditional land of the Nipmuc, Wabanaki Confederacy, and the Pocumtuck peoples past and present whose ancient relationships with the land continue to this day. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Please take a moment to celebrate the resilience and the strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. And for those of us who are joining from another location other than Amherst, please check out the link in the chat to find out more about indigenous communities where you reside. And now I'm honored to welcome today's host who is gonna to introduce today's guest in great academic fashion. It's UMass Professor of Sound Design, Amy Altadonna. Professor Altadonna is an artistic associate with Brooklyn's Cult Core Theater Company where her designs have been heard in many major New York downtown venues. She's also designed all over the place, including Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Shakespeare and Company, the New Georges Theater, Uktar Shakespeare Festival, Yale Repertory, Bard Summerscape, and many, many, many other places. Amy uh, will introduce today's guest. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, this morning. I feel so lucky to introduce Jane Shaw. She has designed countless shows at the nation's most respected theaters and has been recognized many times for her excellence in sound design. She's collaborated at Playwrights Horizons, Theater for a New Audience, Clubbed Thumb, New York Theater Workshop, Lincoln Center, Juilliard, The Mint, Rattlestick, Hartford Stage, Williamstown, The Women's Project, and, and many others. Her long relationships with these theaters and the directors she uh, works with really speaks to her incredible creativity, her collaboration, and her wonderful personality. Rightfully, she's been nominated for and received several top honors, including Lortel Awards, Drama Desk Awards, Henry Hughes, again, among many others. I don't know how she does it, but at the same time, she has worked tirelessly as a founding board member of the Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association, TSDCA, and has led efforts to bring the sound design community together to share knowledge, resources, professional development opportunities, and has turned a motley crew into a real village. 
When COVID hit, she helmed the development of a Facebook group for sound design students so that they could connect to each other, to industry professionals, and to programming and to hands-on opportunities. She's a composer. She participates in salons with other creatives and develops original music. She graduated with an MFA from Yale School of Drama when sound was folded into the TDMP department, making her a trailblazer in what has become the preeminent sound design program in this country. She's clearly someone I look up to. I am fortunate to have her as a friend. Take it away, Jane Shaw. Thank you, Amy, so much. It's so great to be here with you and your school and your students. Thanks to everybody for the uh, work to set this up. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I've known Amy for a long time. We've worked uh, on several on projects together and on this board together for TSDCA. Um, it's really a, a pleasure and a, uh, to always to hang out with her and all of you. So thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm so honored to be representing sound design in this series of talks. I have such respect for Anita Yabich, who you heard from last week, and Jane Cox and Mimi Lian, both of whom I've been able to work with, um, uh, who will appear in later episodes of this series. So I hope you guys tune in and listen to them as well. Uh, so as they said, my name is Jane Shaw and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm currently in Park Slope, Brooklyn on Lenape land. Um, today, I'm gonna begin with a little background, uh, talk about some of my work, and then consider a few of the questions posed by the presenters about what it means to be a woman in this field. So I'm gonna share my little screen here. Hopefully that'll go well. Okay. Okay, I'm hoping you can see that. Someone should give me a thumbs up or a nice note in the chat or something. Okay. Um, let's see what she says. Chat, the chat is chatting to me. Yes. Smiley face, love it. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna start with just, uh, this is like a little collage of pictures sort of that I was thinking about sort of my background. Um, so I was raised in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, sort of in the middle of the country on the land of the Ka and the Kikapu. Uh, I was raised by a Texan and a South African, uh, both of whom are classic scholars. Uh, my mother taught Latin and my father taught Greek. Uh, they introduced me to theater, opera and dance uh, from a young age, we went into Kansas City. Uh, we saw things in Lawrence. And this is slide is an assortment of, of ways of things that, sh that shaped me during my time in Lawrence that I do think contributed to my approach to work and my life as a sound designer. And I offer it as a little bit of insight into who I am, if you have questions later, but also because I think each of you will have similar backgrounds. We all come from unusual, have unusual stories, different places that we came from, or, or share stories. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say piano was my, in terms of starting with music, piano is my first instrument. Uh, but really, I think that it was my experience as a violist in orchestra that really made me understand the power of music and what it was, what a soundscape was. Uh, the viola section's in the middle of the orchestra, uh, for those of you that don't know. And I was aware that I was immersed in sound. I could hear the lines of a piece of music as they were picked up by various instruments traveling around me, diagonally across to the first violins, back to the left with the basses, over my right shoulder to the woodwinds. Although at that point I had no idea there even existed the role of a sound designer, this was certainly my first understanding of a soundscape, the thrill of being surrounded by sound. And I was learning something about the piece from listening to it from within. And I hope to share that with other people, uh, you know, as they come and are immersed in soundscapes of shows that I work on. Uh, on the bottom left, you'll see I also played in a bell choir, uh, which, uh, which toured internationally. Thank you very much. Um, which uh, is a completely different way to think about music. So in a bell choir, you only hold, you know, a certain number of bells. So I was kind of right in the middle. I was like D, D sharp, E, and F. So as you watch the piece of music go by, when you hit those notes, I would play my bell. So you can sort of see them all in their outfits. That's actually, that's not my bell choir, but that is my church. And that is uh, one of the women that conducted me when I was there. Um, so you thought about music in a completely different way. Now I'm not playing an entire lyrical line. I have to be very, very aware of where I am in a piece of music. Uh, and I just wanted to point out, for those of you that know the piece, The Flight of the Bumblebee, uh, we played it on bells. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> it was really, it was really fun and kind of crazy. Um, 
I think we all have people in our lives that introduced us to different parts of theater. Uh, for me, it was the Averills. Uh, there's a picture of them up on the top center. Uh, Rick and Jeannie Averill. Uh, I've never been really a performer. Uh, I So I was not in Rick's plays. Uh, Jeannie taught the classes at the high school. I wasn't there. Um, where I ran into them was actually at church. So Rick was the most fun youth leader I've ever met. Uh, he was irreverent. Uh, he cracked like a duck. He, um, but uh, really, really cared about us and, and cared about what we were studying in this particular um, youth group. So that connection between uh, church and theater was very clear to me from the beginning. You know, I definitely see parallels there in terms of a group of people coming together uh, to share a story, to understand a story. Um, and even though obviously the church and the theater have had multi, uh, you know, difficult relationships over the years, um, I, for me, they were entwined early. Uh, so we're gathering to, in, that, in those places, we're gathering to hear a story, a story that has powerful human implications, a story that often requires a suspension of disbelief and perhaps reinterprets what it means to believe. And this was a way that I sort of came into theater. I was in theater club at, at high school, but as I said, I was not a performer. So uh, the award that I won was for best attendance because I really couldn't figure out like, how I might actually fit into this. Sound design was not something that, uh, that I think, although there were pit orchestras and there certainly was sound around some of the uh, pieces, the idea that there was a single person called a sound designer uh, wasn't, on, wasn't understood at, at that time in Lawrence, Kansas. I, when I, there's a picture of Nagoya Jin there on the slide um, uh, over there on the right. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, I had the opportunity to go to Japan for a summer, sort of uh, out of the blue. I lived with a uh, family there for at about two and a half months. Uh, really powerful experience in terms of being uh, made aware of different cultures. Um, I also learned what it was like to be the only white person in a room, uh, to have no one want to sit next to me on the train. Uh, it's obviously everybody has different experience with this kind of thing, um, but it was a little bit of a window for me into that uh, reality for some. Uh, I was immersed into a culture so unlike my own. I was taught dances uh, about the harvest. I was eating food that I had never imagined uh, that possibly I thought should be cooked first, um, but it was wonderful, overwhelming and life-changing. Uh, even learning rudiments of the language was an exercise in a rhythm that I didn't understand. I think I'm a bit addicted to this feeling now. I really miss it during the pandemic. And that is that I love to travel. Uh, I love exploring new places. And I do think that some of my most successful theater work has been when I treat the play as a new country, that I need to learn the language, the customs and discover what I've never seen or heard before. Over there on the left, the man at the typewriter is Langston Hughes. Uh, I certainly didn't know him. He died uh, before I was born. Uh, for those of you that don't know, he was a leader of the Harlem Renaissance. He was a poet, a playwright, essayist, and he formed a theater troupe. Uh, he spent much of his child in Lawrence, childhood in Lawrence, Kansas, just as I did, uh, staying with his grandmother. Uh, and we even went to the same grade school. Uh, I put him on this sheet because, uh, although very important in my hometown, very important to us as a country, uh, but it was only during this last year, during the pandemic, that I learned that he attended Pinckney School, the school that I went to, uh, because it was the because he was forced to. It was a segregated school. This was not something that was publicly known when when I was young. Uh, and I, Lawrence, Kansas, is on the uh, is it was part of the um, we we think we're the heart of the Civil War. I'm sure there are other people, perhaps on the East Coast, that have different feelings about Lawrence, Kansas. But we uh, in the fight between the free and the slave states, there was. Uh, uh, Lawrence was one of the um, sort of flashpoints, I would say. Um, we were raided and burned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I always thought of us as being, as living that in every, as, as living that as a, as a town. The idea that we were segregated, I was, was shocking to me. Uh, and I am in some ways glad that the pandemic made me slow down and learn a little bit more his, about the history of my own hometown. Um, there's so much that we're not taught. 
And of course, schools should constantly evaluate curriculum. But it's also up to each of us to poke at this past and learn about the people, places, and events that have not stayed in the main narrative to uncover those stories. So I came out east uh, for college. I was at Harvard studying the bi biochemistry. I put the picture of the titration there because I have to say that's the moment in the lab where I was like, maybe this is not for me. Uh, so let's see. And uh, it was here on the East Coast. Um, I Just a quick shout out to Ben Emerson. I think I saw you on the attendant list. I'm so honored. Um, he was already working in the Boston area, uh, but I met Chris Walker, the first um, sound designer I ever really knew uh, at American Repertory Theater. Uh, he also did the pyro at the theater, and he was the first sound designer I really knew, so I sort of thought that all sound designers did pyro, and since I didn't want to blow things up, I thought this could not be the future for me, but he assured me he was unusual, it was okay, I could continue in sound design. Uh, I really didn't know anything uh, at all, uh, about theater, about the fact that the amps needed to be turned on to the, make the speakers work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, Chris was a great mentor and sort of helped me uh, with those first few sound designs. Uh, I, and I was gonna say that the first thing that I was ever aware of in a sound design way was that my father played the thunder sheet uh, for a local production of the magic flute. And I can remember being like, why? So he's a professor of classics at the University of Kansas, but he's really excited about the thunder sheet in the magic flute. This must be uh, exciting for, this could be exciting for, uh, for me as well. Uh, it was while I was at Harvard, um, the, the picture in the right in the middle, uh, Shlemiel the first, um, this was a production by David Gordon and Bob Rustein. And there was inventive choreography with the musicians. It was a great story. It was really fun. What really got me was the klezmer music that was accompanying the piece. Uh, this, these were instruments I knew and I had never heard them played like this. And I was thrilled. And suddenly I wanted to see all the shows. <laughs> like if this was happening on this show, what was happening on the next show? Uh, and you know that excitement hopefully stays with me. Um, I know that Anita Yavich made this point last week, but really one of the best things we can do to grow as artists is to see more theater. And I know that's difficult right now, um, but there are online recordings. There are people that are making theater now, um, You know, looking at pictures, looking at art. And I, I shouldn't even just say just theater, just but looking at art watching each other's work, uh, seeing other people meet the stage of the stage really helps us grow as artists. And uh, just moving on historically a little bit here. So I, uh, another picture I used on the bottom right is the outside stage of Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival, uh, where I spent five summers working in a variety of roles. Again, this, this was a very quick way to see a ton of art. So there were three venues, two of them did 20 shows a summer. This outside venue had a different show every night. Suddenly you were exposed to so much. So for me, there were uh, some of the main points for me were Mark Morris, he was a very, he loved music, he loved live music. Um, along the classical lines, Elizabeth Streb, for those of you that don't know her after this, go and Google some Elizabeth Streb, always fun. Um, she, you know, she, impact, how, what does it mean to fall? very interested in falling. And then her sound designer worked on the sound of that fall and worked and what do you hear and had mics that picked up actually physically the sound of the fall, but then had it trigger other sounds. This was, I'd never heard this before. Uh, then there was a huge uh, international group also at the pillow. Uh, Pilar Rioja was one. Uh, Garth Fagan, some of you may know him as the choreographer for Lion King. Um, really, really interesting uh, choreographer uh, in, in my book, but these are just to name a few. I went straight to grad school after undergrad. I don't necessarily recommend this um, as I think that it's good to see some of the world, um, but I did go to Yale School of Drama as Amy, as Amy mentioned directly upon graduating. And I was admitted to the sound design program, which was at that point in the technical design and production department. Although we did take classes with the rest of the designers. And up on the right, up right is a picture of me in the program at that time. And I was lucky, I entered and the two ladies to my left were in the couple of years ahead of me. So from the, um, their, their names are Laura Grace Brown and Kat Martis. Um, so this was the late nineties and approximately a third of the sound design students were women. I didn't doubt I belonged. I saw other people that looked like me in the program that I feel very lucky. 
it's an ongoing problem that if we don't see people who look like us in a position, we don't think we can attain that position. But we also, there's also an issue of erasure. There's also an issue of people forgetting and not clear, it not being clearly sort of in the historical record. Um, so we also need to sort of look for ourselves as to who was really there. Uh, I once did a P, I, I, or I recently did a piece where um, someone wrote me and they said, I think it was a, it was a piece about um, uh, the Jewish population of Vilna that was pretty much wiped out in the Second World War. And I'd found some recordings of some artists that were associated with that village. And one of them wrote me and said, I think that's my aunt who's playing the piano in the piece. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And like, we sort of went back and I was like, oh, but it says, but the name in the record of the record, like on iTunes or whatever was, is a male name. It's not your aunt, but it was his aunt. Um, it was a Francis that they had taken as a male Francis as opposed to a female Francis. So there's, I think because they assumed it, you know, so I think there's, there's a ratio on all sorts of, in us forgetting, in things being written down incorrectly, uh, we just have to always keep looking for what really happened. Okay. Uh, so I leave drama school. It was great. I loved it. I learned a whole, I learned a lot about sound, but I also learned about the structure. I'm sure uh, you all that are in school now or, or working professionally, you know, we have design meetings, uh, we think and work together, we collaborate, we exchange ideas, we work in rehearsal, we have this long tech period where we put it all together, you know, all this stuff. So pretty much my first uh, professional job turned that on its head. So my, I did teach a couple years at NYU, but my, but then I went on tour with the Merce Cunningham company, um, which was uh, just, uh, I was very lucky. It was very, uh, a wonderful company to be part of. Um, so that's Merce up in the left next to his partner, John Cage. Um, for those of you that don't know, Merce Cunningham was a leader in the modern dance world um, for decades on the cutting edge of performance. Uh, and his partner, John Cage, is a giant in music and sound and mushroom. Uh, he's also a mushroom expert uh, for the 20th century. You may have heard of uh, Cage's work, 433, uh, which is the dur a durational piece. It's a, where musicians sit without playing for four minutes and 33 seconds. But I think m more importantly, and, and so maybe, maybe also exemplified by 433, that John was interested in sound as music. Um, I, he had a description of what it, what it sounded like outside their apartment on Sixth Avenue, the music of New York City. Uh, the, speaking about John Cage is a completely different webinar and someone should definitely, and if you don't know more about him, just again, someone definitely worth Googling. Um, sadly, he had not, he had passed away by the time I joined the company. Uh, the gentleman in the center, uh, Takihisa Kasugi was the music director when I joined the Cunningham company. Uh, so I show up for the first uh, day of work and they're rehearsing a piece. So I figure out what the music is supposed to be for the piece and I start to put it together. And I just remember the dancers being like, no, Jane, we don't, we don't rehearse. We don't rehearse with the music. Why would you not rehearse with the music? This is, this is what I understand rehearsal to be. Um, but that was not how that company worked at all. There was no rehearse with music, work it out in tech at all. It was Morse Cunningham met with the, uh, the artists that were going to do the decor and the music. He would say, this is the name of the piece. It's Winter Branch. It's gonna be at city center on this and this date, show up. Completely different from everything that I had learned at Yale. Totally throwing all that out the window. I like collaborating. I like working in rehearsal. I like working in tech. So I certainly did not then suddenly switch into a different way of working, but this showed me that A, there's not one way of working. You make amazing art doing it all sorts of different ways. Uh, and, and also it raised, in some odd way, it raised the bar. If you were gonna show up at that time for that premiere and no one had ever heard it before, it better be good. And, it's, and uh, I loved that, um, that side to the, uh, the, the Cunningham work thing. Um, ooh, I didn't mean to go back, go back. Uh, the other thing that I'll just say for Cunningham was that he, long history of working with um, great artists. 
So up on the right um, behind Ashley giving a big leap there is the um, decor for a piece called Innerscape. Um, that's by Rob Rauschenberg. The piece on the bottom is Sound Dance and I put the Matisse next to it. Many people think that um, Merce was thinking about the Matisse circle when he made Sound Dance. Um, he, uh, amazing interaction with the rest of the art community. I do think that we sometimes get segmented you know, theater, music, dance, and we, in our own little piles and, or our little boxes. And uh, Merce was a great, um, he, he showed me the power of bringing in artists from different groups. It meant that the artist, the fine artist who was coming in maybe didn't understand what it meant to tour a piece, blah, blah, blah. But the wealth and the beauty was, was so worth, worth, uh, um, worth, figure, you know, worth figuring it out. Uh, also, I just want to say a second about chance operations, just a moment about chance operations. This is maybe how many people know. Oh, I keep trying to, I just really want to show you that piece of music. Um, so chance operations, many people think that it's that both with John, with music and with Merce, that there was this idea of sort of rolling the dice to go to the next move. And uh, Merce had a piece of software that he used for movement, especially as he got older and it was more difficult for him to move. Um, John had lots of theories about I Ching and music, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to say, say that that's not true, that that didn't play a part in their work. I think it did. Um, with, there was definitely a show near the end of Merce's life where at the beginning of the piece, they rolled the dice and that determined what light cues, that, which set of light cues that was played, whether they played the music of Sigur Ross or someone else. Uh, as w what costumes they played. So they definitely used that in their work, but many times it was a way of just opening up possibility. So if you really lay everything out and you roll a set of dice to go to do an A chord, a B chord, a seven sus or whatever you're gonna do, it just opens up your mind in a different way. So that idea of like op of, of opening up your mind in your creative process was really powerful. Something I took from um, working with the company. Uh, so this piece of music that I keep trying to show you on the slideshow. So this uh, on the left is 108, which was the piece of music for Interscape that I was that we were looking at on the other slide, and it was for one cello, or one cello and 108 musicians. So a uh, couple of things that I just wanted to share about this. One was that music, the way you know, there are unusual ways of writing music, and this has happened. I, I put the Hiroshima, the Trinity for the victims of Hiroshima, next to it. It's not just, uh, you know, a recent change. This has been in our world. Um, they're both, I think, amazing pieces, um, but they do require a different way of working with musicians. Uh, and just in passing, I'll say when we did the piece 108 in Venice at the, the premiere, one of the things that it says is all of his instructions in the piece was that the, the, the percussion music needs to be uh, separate, the, the instruments need to be you know, unique and resonant, and that is it. And the, uh, the percussion section at the Fenice went into Venice's archives of all these different percussion instruments, wind instruments, drums you've never seen before. I mean, they took up so much space, which I could talk about another time, but they took up so much space in the, what was in sort of an extended pit. And it was an amazing sound that they created. And their musical inspiration that now I've just given you like the first three minutes of the piece over there on the left, but that that's kind of where they were starting from. Um, the percussion actually doesn't come in until later in the piece. I should be, I should be um, honest about that. Uh, but then we also toured the piece to Montpellier and um, that orchestra was like, this doesn't look like music I play. And it was ugly and they didn't want to play and it was unfriendly and they didn't, they didn't, they did not consent to play it. And um, that sort of, even though I actually very, very much respect the conductor who did this and I think he really did try to um, make them understand what they were trying to create. Um, it did give me a window into there, you run into collaboration in all sorts of ways and putting down a piece of music in front of a musician does not mean that they're going to play it, you know, and, and how you present things and how you get people excited and on board with you is important. Okay. 
All right. So why not? Why have I been talking about all this music and and dance and all this stuff for so long? Sorry, guys. Here, so let's talk about some sound design. Um, this is uh, various pictures of various shows that I have worked on that were important to me. And all I just want to say is that uh, with this slide is that uh, every journey has been different. They've been different sizes. Uh, the one on the bottom right, you see there, I got to work with, with Mr. Kevin Bacon. So I got my six degrees uh, project in, which is very fun. Um, but then the uh, picture up on the left, Tina Banco there, um, in a piece called Jackie was in a small basement theater uh, in New York City. Um, no, no, it's, I just saw the, the chat. No, 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 it's uh, Kevin Bacon in the wheelchair. Um, uh, so we won't let him know that you thought he was William H. Basie. Um, okay, so then, uh, and musicals, uh, that's uh, Eddie Get Your Gun in the bottom uh, center, uh, the Royale, uh, which I think is an amazing piece. I'm, I'm sure uh, people here have done that one. Uh, Men on Boats, uh, the women up there, um, uh, women or those identify as women in terms of the, the picture up there in the center, maybe also a piece that you guys know. But I wanted to think about, um, I know many of you know all about sound design, so I'll just say briefly, this is like some of the things that excite me and get me, um, uh, you know, wanting to do more and more sound. Um, so what can we do with sound? So we can build music and sound layers that lift and deepen emotion, suspense, fulfillment, and joy. And joy, I start with Rick Averill back there quacking like a duck in the church service. Joy is so important. Uh, and also Cage, there's a story about um, someone came to Merce during a show and said, you know, I think we need to, I'm so sorry, but there's a crazy person who is underneath the risers with a stick and he's banging under, you know, he's, you know, banging on them so that the people are like jumping. And uh, Merce Cunningham was like, no, it's okay. It's okay. It was, it's John Cage. Don't, don't worry. He's just providing additional support for their uh, theatrical experience. So joy is part, part of it. It's okay. I'm not going to bang any uh, sticks on anybody's streets, seats, but I do think joy is important. Um, developing a context, such as location, time period, per time of day, and most importantly, aspects of the world that we can't see. We have such all design aspects support this, but I do think sound has a little sneaky in on this. You know, we're in the dark, we're in the world around them. I mean, yes, you can have site specific theater and have other elements, but in every show, sound can activate the space on all sides of a human. Sort of like what I was thinking about when I was playing viola in orchestra. We can play, we, we can activate the space all around you. Uh, drive the tempo, tension, release of a story. Uh, creating systems to support musicians and actors, and then I know this sort of looks boring here at the bottom about delivery of sound to the audience through speaker systems, but I'm gonna be honest that that is something that really gets me excited. And that is like, how and why is this sound coming at us? Like, is it coming at us? Okay, so we've got the sort of left right thing that we're all used to kind of like a boom box coming at us, okay. But like in this world, so sadly, Ben and I were gonna do a show together right before the shutdown and it had a house. So where did the sound on stage? It had a house on stage. Uh, and where does the sound come from in this house? The house actually didn't kind of really have walls, but we needed to have an idea of a room. So how can we get the sound for an idea of a room upstage? Or how can we get something? I, I know that there's gonna be sort of some unusual animal life. Where can that sneak onto the set? Great. And then what does that mean about, and there's a, so there was a little surprise, a little mystery. How does that come at the audience from all, you know, from the surround? So I really like speaker, I have to say, get excited about where's how sound comes to the audience. Uh, so just a couple of shows that I wanted to specifically think about like those things with or lessons that I learned from them. Uh, this is the Crucible at uh, Cleveland Playhouse. Uh, I'll say one lesson that I really learned in grad school uh, was to pay attention to costumes. And I say this partly because I am not someone who's very good with clothes at all. Like I learned that one separates whites and colors like maybe a week ago. So clothes in general aren't something that I naturally like am interested in or excited about. So then I was there, I was doing my big show in grad school and uh, I'd worked hard, I'd been in rehearsal, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. 
set. I knew all about the set. I knew what it looked like. I'd, you know, I thought about what the speakers were, et cetera, et cetera. I hadn't paid attention to the costumes. And please don't tell the costume designer. And I, um, that first moment, that first moment of tech, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but up over the back, it was a large head on stage, up over the back of the head comes people dressed in sort of futuristic, somewhat Star Trek-like garb in a, in a Greek play. Did I mention it was a Greek play? In a Greek play. And it just blew my mind. Suddenly the world that we were creating blew up in my face. I didn't understand, the rules had changed. So although one might say I learned this lesson late, I will say at least I learned it. And now I very much pay attention to the costumes um, from the beginning. And in this case, for example, what Lex Liang was doing here is um, they're wearing, mo the, the clothes are many of them sort of off the rock, uh, off the rock, off the rack, um, modern clothes, but they're sort of worn-ish in a period way. You know, it's pretty proper. They're pretty buttoned up. They're pretty covered. The ladies are pretty covered. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to get, uh, uh, but if there are other pictures in the show where you see there's a lot of leather <laughs> that goes on. Um, but that made me, that I learned something about the show from looking at those costume drawings. I also learned from the fact that they put it in the round. This is a theater that's a flexible space. Um, this, uh, and so I learned something from Scott. I learned something from ML, um, the lighting designer, because I, and I don't, she does not always work this way, but in this particular case, she really tried to create one state. I mean, of course there were shifts, but one state per act of that play, a cohesive gesture for an entire space. I thought that, I thought that was important. Um, but for me, the, the, I'll say that the way into this was, I was gonna, I brought it up for sound because the way into it was a, was a um, uh, thank you, Anna Marie for the time check, um, was uh, through found materials. So I was sort of having a hard time getting into it and I got into it by learning some old hymns and teaching them to the cast. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but actually in this scene, which is right at the top of the show, supposedly members of the of the town have gathered to pray for this um, girl who's possessed and they're maybe singing. And it was starting from that and that ended up being woven throughout the play. Um, but it was just a, I try to sneak up on plays, you know, come in the back door and coming in the back door was the, with the hymns for this one was, was important to me. Okay, I'm gonna go through that next two just a, a little quick. Oh, um, I'll just say you can also be inspired by musicians. Um, this is a huge gift. I worked on a measure for measure where I was given a band. They were awesome. I was given it really late. So it all happened really fast, but maybe that helped us, I don't know. Um, uh, this is Ose Ased. Uh, he's a guitar player, vocalist, uh, and sort of led the group of musicians that I uh, worked with on this piece. I never can say too much uh, positive, too many, po enough positive things about working with musicians. Um, and then just to give you sort of a feel for this, this, as I said, by, you know, at this point, hopefully 20 years in, I've learned to look at the costumes. So I sort of knew what world we're dealing with. I'll say was a, um, is a electric guitarist, vocalist, um, and this is a Shakespeare play, um, but I understood that we were sort of in this kind of created world with definitely modern elements. Um, we used some sonnets for inspiration, for, for lyrics, for the songs that the band played, um, but it, 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 it grew in that sort of rehearsal room uh, with them. Uh, okay. And then The last one that I wanted to share with you, partly because I know the other two are sort of classical, but I did think that probably people had read The Crucible or Measure for Measure. Um, I, uh, this was a piece at uh, Two River Theater called El Coquilla Spectacular and the Bottle of Doom. Um, and I bring it up for a couple of reasons. One was this was, this is an example of where working in rehearsal was super important. Um, there were huge fight scenes and so, and they were all underscored. So figuring out, or I wouldn't say, underscored, I would say scored, capital 
capital S, uh, music was driving the action uh, and working, understanding the structure of those fights and working with the fight director about what needed to be and what to do accent, what the tempo was, um, getting people excited about the fight um, was part of this process. I also wanted to bring it up because it's an example of a very long relationship. Um, Jose Zayas and I met in undergrad I'm not sure what Jose concentrated in, but I was still concentrating in biochemistry. And uh, we did summer theater there and we're still working together 20 years later. Not all the time, but like every so often, we've done uh, some crazy things. He's brought me into the Spanish language theater in New York City, uh, which has been uh, an amazing um, experience to, to see a, a, a part, a, you know, to see and hear theater that I would not normally um, be a part of. So that's been really great. Uh, and uh, this is also a exa good example of uh, collaboration that head that you, the, the, the uh, this is our chupacabra, uh, the, the, the uh, bad guy in our show there you see on stage. Uh, although maybe I'm referring to him in two two dimensional way, but anyway, El Chupacabra there uh, needed to speak in that mask. So figuring out how the uh, we mic'd him inside the mask, and that was the collaboration with the costume department and uh, and the actor. Absolutely, um, uh, really fun uh, collaboration here with video design, lighting, um, quite different from the Crucible and uh, the Measure for Measure. Who's in sound design? I'll just do a little quick brief. There are a lot of women in sound. Uh, and there have been for a long time. Uh, leading BBC sound effects lady there in the bottom right. Um, the problem is not necessarily the pipeline. As I said, in Yale, at Yale, there were a third of the sound designers when I joined were female. Um, and if you get into diversity in terms of sound, it's even worse. Uh, than it is when you look at uh, simple, uh, simply at gender. Uh, just to sort of give you a little bit of an idea, um, about 28-ish percent, 25 to 28 percent of union sound designers are female. Only 19 percent of them in the smallest Lord Theater are female. And then as you get into the bigger fees, it goes way, way down to like 1 percent. So that's, there's something wrong. There's something wrong there. Uh, and I certainly don't let it get me down. I used not to talk about it at all. I used to not, I used to really want us all to just to talk about like what, how I made sound or what excited me, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't want to uh, dwell at all on the fact that I was female. Uh, but when I look at the faces of the women who are in this field, you see Amy up there as well, who uh, introduced me. Um, when I look at them, uh, and I realize it's not just about me getting a job, it's about all these wonderful artists getting a job and that their voices aren't being heard. Uh, then I know we need to speak up and we need to recognize that these are the numbers and we need to fight against them. And much of this is subconscious. Much of this action on director's part, on artistic director's part is subconscious. And so I don't, I don't go through life thinking there are a lot of bad people in the world. Um, but I do think that there are some bad actions and some of them are, are my actions. You know, some of them are, are things that I need to, need to re-examine in myself. Uh, but women are out there and they're amazing. And I can uh, tell you about some of these wonderful ladies later, if you wish. Um, just a few other pictures of them. That's Sunny Kill up there on the right. She was part of the, um, the uh, Olympic team, sound team that was uh, um, uh, in uh, South Korea. Uh, Partnerships so important in this field. Uh, down there on the right is Karen Ford, who's been the mixer for Scott Lehrer for so long. Uh, you see the ladies who designed Othello over there on the bottom left, including Jane Cox, who you'll hear from next week or in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then up on the left is, um, is a snap from a Zoom hangout from TSDCA, which uh, Amy mentioned I'm a part of and is a, a, way, a group that's building community um, in the sound uh, field. And that's us all hanging out. And the people in that picture are on all sides of the coasts. We've got people on the West Coast, East Coast. We've got people in Chicago. Um, we have uh, a mixer up there. Um, we have we have several mixers up there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think we're it's a it's a powerful thing to build community in this world. Um, so thank you so much. Sorry, I went a little bit long, but um, I'd be happy to accept questions. No, thank you. <laughs>
I am blown away and I am digesting so much that you brought to this conversation. I, I'm, I'm amazed and inspired. Um, wow. Oh my hey, gosh. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Wow. Oh my God. You, you address so many wonderful things that I was curious about and that I was getting questions from others about. Um, uh, so, so I'm going to throw this one at you because I thought this was really interesting. Um, Mickey, who is um, working with me this semester, asked, uh, you know, if you feel like you've hit a block in the road, how do you re-inspire your creativity? And I, you sort of touched on this because you had that big shift with the show where the people came out in costumes. Uh, yeah. you know, expecting. So I'm just, and, and you know, you talk about so many great ways that you do. I love entering in the back door and finding these interesting ways. But yeah, I mean, what happens if you, if you run into an obstacle? Or I don't know if you can kind of riff on that for a little bit. I'll say when I was in high school, I went to the guidance counselor and I was like, I have a procrastination problem. <laughs> what should I do? And she said, Jane, I think you're going to always procrastinate. I think we just need to face facts. It's just going to always be who you are. So you need to always have things that you can do that are important on some other project. So you procrastinate with other things. So when I really hit a wall, I do get up and go and work on something else. I mean, to be honest, and that's actually, and that is actually during this time one of the ways that's been great is I go freaking play the piano. It's actually, and I, it's not like I'm a great piano player, but it's like, I need to practice because I have lessons. In fact, it's two o'clock today is when I have my next lesson. But, you know, it's, it just, it gets me up. It gets me over to something else. If I play a music from a completely different composer in a completely different time frame, it has nothing to do with whatever I'm working on, but it like shakes, shakes me up. So there's nothing like that. And, and, and also what I really like also about sound design is that there are so many different things you could be doing. You could be working on your sound plot. You could be doing all this technical stuff. You could be doing the paperwork or you could be composing the song in the fourth act or you could be communicating with the director and figuring out what that relationship is. So there's a way to procrastinate even within the same show, <laughs> but it happens to all of us, you know? And that's also why I mentioned like the, the chance operations. There are lots of other people that have thought about ways to break open those creative uh, blockades. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh my God, there's just so many phenomenal questions coming in. Um, so can you just talk a little bit now about career stuff? So, you know, one of my questions from my friend and former student, Elissa, was, you know, whether you feel a master's degree is necessary. Um, and, and I don't know if you can roll that into some other thoughts about, um, you know, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at Gemma's question here. Um, like how can people enter from different backgrounds at different times and what are the pressures on people and and maybe that pulls in the representation question so i don't know if you can riff on all that so okay i'll a couple of questions in there i i um i don't think that a master's is necessary um i but on the flip side if i had not gone to yale and got that gotten that degree there's no way i would be doing this now but that's sort of also specific to my journey like I didn't have any connections at all, other than that one, Chris Walker. Um, maybe I should have gotten and talked to Ben, um, but other than that, I didn't have any connections. So I didn't, the, the, for me, that was a way that I could be in theaters and they would let me work on equipment and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it opened, it let me have that experience. But there are a lot of great sound designers out there that do not have masters. So it's not, that's not necessary. I do think it's necessary to work with other sound designers. And I think that did happen for me in the master's program. And I actually regret that I have not done as much of that after I left. I think you and I have talked about the fact that like, I, um, I was confused about assisting. I should have, I think that's the way to do it. I think that you want to go assist. You want to learn how other people work. It, you are not diminishing yourself by being an assistant. You, you are actually sneaking in the back door again and getting to be in a room where you're not on the hot seat and you see how other people make theater. And that is an incredible 
opportunity. And I definitely did not take in as much advantage of it as I wish I had now. Um, so that's, I think that doing that sort of apprentice track um, is a way in. And people, people are open, you know, people are, it's a good, it's a nice community. I think um, Anita spoke about this last week too, you know, the, um, we may all be slightly odd, but I think for the most part, we're quite generous people. <laughs> and I think reaching out is okay, you know, like, so that's a, that's a way to do it. Yeah, I, I, that I, all answered some of it. But. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I came to grad school because I hit a point in my creative life where I realized I did not have the technical skill to continue to support the ideas I was having and the goals I had for my shows. Um, so I, you know, came to a, a training program after I'd had some experiences and I had actually some really clear goals and needs. So that also helped me find a program that worked great for me because it was addressing those things yeah. specifically. And, and yes, we did have that conversation. I feel the same way. One of my only assisting um, experiences was with you on the I, show. Yes, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> right. It wasn't even like I was there from the beginning, you know, but, but even that small exposure um, to a, a level budgetarily and, and, you know, um, big name wise of theater I had not been exposed to and watching that process was very eye opening. Um, I mean, I learned a lot from even the sliver of time that I was there. So thank you. And frankly, I learned a lot about watching you navigate this heavily male dominated experience that that in my eyes because I'm such a downtown type of person like felt a little corporatized in some yeah. ways um yeah and I I was that was I think the first time in my life that I was like oh people are gonna maybe treat you differently depending on your gender identity I know it's really yeah. sad when because I think you don't know that it's really sad when that you realize that it's yeah. very, and it's, it's very sad to watch other people realize that and I don't and that's why it obviously should not be that way yeah yeah so, yeah wow oh my gosh okay there's so many questions so um Tracy my friend uh she asked on behalf of a sound designer in her life whether TSDCA would um be good for someone who works at Disney and wants to do sound work and do some more interdisciplinary like technical and design things. And I'm going to answer that. Yes. <laughs> so we, so yeah, the, um, so TSCCA, so this is Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association is a group of about 425 um, people from across the country. And it definitely includes people in a variety of different pockets of sound. Um, but we also have a lot of things that are public you know, on the web, so on the website. You know, some of it is you, some videos, some classes are only for members, but there's quite a bit that is public that anybody can go look at. Um, so any, you know, check it out, check and see if you, if you like the feel of it, you know, and, and the variety, um, you know, of the, there's a lot of salons that are really composer based, but then we just had something about production sound for film that I thought was fantastic. And, you know, so it's, it's a wide variety. Um, it's also learning the community. I mean, just meeting people, which is part of this business. And I think one thing we're trying to do with TSCCA with the sort of community branches that if anybody, it, it, these community hangouts, anybody can show up. There's no, there's no what part of your career are you in, what part of the country do you live in? It's just anybody can show up. And then you, you meet people, you know, and, uh, and you never know <laughs> who's going to hire you or who's going to be, you know, be the production sound person on your next gig or, you know, it's this, you never know. So, um, this is a good, it is a good way to branch out. Um, but there are, I will also say there are a lot of associations out there and in particular in this time making overtures to members. So, you know, check them all out, see what's, you know, see what works for you. Yeah. I think the learning, the shared knowledge in any kind of a group situation uh, is really valuable. And then like the other day, I, I put, I'm put i just going to name check her. I put Megan Cully out there for something that I couldn't do. And, and I knew her through that organization. And you do kind of say, oh, I actually know this person well enough. I could say that. Um, yeah. So it, it definitely helps in a lot of ways. 
Yes, um, yes. We only have a few minutes left, but um, Corey Shore just asked, um, hi, Corey, uh, do you have a favorite Sonic moment that has stuck with you? I can never think of those when I'm on the spot. I know, it's, it's so tricky. tricky. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I'll just really go back to uh, that Schlemiel, that moment when that first, like, I don't know, it was something in the Woodwind family, Oboe, like, shrieked out this amazing riff. And I was like, what the, what just happened? Like, you know, I'd set up the pit. I knew who was playing down there. I didn't know what that was. Like, that was amazing. What happens? Um you know, I just, I mean, maybe I'm thinking of that because I uh, just spoke about it, but I love those. I love those moments. You know, those are, that's, that's definitely one that stands out, uh, stands out to me. I'll, if I think of other ones, I'll, I'll bring them up, but that, that's the one that jumps to mind. Yeah, that's really great. Well, Anna Maria, how are we doing for time? Do we need to wrap it up? I've never not gotten cut off due to talking too long. So I had to ask. Okay. <laughs> so um, Jordan Mitchell, who helped really spearhead this whole um, women in design series. Yes. She has something that I was also kind of curious about, you know, what tools do you use to design and collaborate? And I feel like given that we're in this time of exploration as an industry, and also we have some extra time on our hands to explore. I'm wondering if there's something that you're like, whoa, this is new, or I stumbled upon this. Like, I don't know if there's anything to highlight. I think it has shown, like, because we're only interacting via Zoom and that, and there's no personal interaction, like there's no, physical, I'm sharing this space. Oh, you kind of laughed at my joke or, oh, you didn't react at all. Uh oh. <laughs> um, because there's none of that, I am being made aware of like how much more I, I need to communicate with the people that are on my teams and really talk about how we're sharing material. So like pragmatically, uh, I used to work only in Ableton. I'm now working, you know, two thirds of my day is more in Pro Tools than Ableton because I can share the session and they can, there are easier ways to communicate with the Pro Tools sessions. But that's also because the people that I'm working with are more comfortable in Pro Tools, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's, it's also about that we, because everything's internet, we, we, we have to actually be even more on it about communicating as humans talking. I just had an example of where I like tried to share information about something. I did this really, like I thought it was amazing spreadsheet with lots of tabs and it was really clearly laid out. And they were like, Jane, can you please just give us this information? And I was like, I don't know if you checked it out, but this Google Doc's amazing. And it's like laid out with all these tabs and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever about the Google Doc, can you just share the information? And I was like, oh, okay you're not up for opening my Google, you know, like, you, like, okay, how do you need the information? Like what, okay, so you show me what, and, and it, um, uh, this happens on theaters all the time in terms of, but I feel like we're a little more used to it. I guess I just, I just want us to not forget, like we're used to like, okay, I, you, I send you my plot information. You tell me how it fits in with my system. Oh, let's figure out how we communicate, but we're sort of, used to that flow and we're also used to not totally understanding <laughs> you know like you get somebody else's paperwork and you're like i do why did they do yeah i don't get it what are those letters stand for why the letters um and then you figure it out but i feel like because it's even more important the communication so anyway yeah yeah it, it's kind of been a refresher for me as well that really we, you know, or I feel like I should be doing that all the time. It, it, I don't know, the way you're talking about reading your collaborators and finding your way in with them actually really resembles in my mind, the way that you talk about the plays. And I, that was actually one of the things that really stood out to me when I got to watch you at work was, um, <laughs> you know, you were the person most doing that, um, coming in with some openness and, I just saw you adapt, adapt, adapt. And I, I was really inspired by that. 
So I think it's in your creative work and it's in your interpersonal relationships. Good, but always growing. Always, 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 you know, learning, learning new things, but thank you. Great. Thanks. I think we've been given the hook. Right. <laughs> uh, now that I'm used to. Okay. Um, so, so there have been a couple more really great questions that I'd love to resume when we pop over to the rest of our class. Um, yeah, thank you, Jane, so much for coming and thoughtfully sharing all of this wonderful insight um, into your process and, and how you see theater and how you see theater in this world today. And thank you everyone for showing up. Oh my God, Philip, oh my God, all of our BFFs are here. Um, oh, so, so thank nice. you for showing thank up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.